So in the morning, I'll get up about 4.30, 4.45, give my wife and kids a kiss, put my gym clothes on, put my hood over my head, and go grind it out of the gym. I think it's important to get up in the morning and accomplish something, and I think the gym gives you a sense of accomplishment early in your day. And then you're gonna ask yourself, you know, well, what's next after the gym, before you go to the hospital or before you go and read and study? So I think it's really important to get up in the morning and get your gym on or get your grind on, whatever it is, get up and do something. Because if you're not up doing something, you know that somebody else is. I'm Cedric Jamie Rutland, and this is a day in my life. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician, which means I take care of people with lung problems, and I take care of people in the intensive care unit. The intensive care unit is a unit that houses people who, whose organs are failing, people who aren't doing well, people who are dying. As a pulmonary critical care physician, traditionally it's thought of you either do critical care or you do pulmonary. I do both. I do it all. I do it all day long minute by minute, hour by hour, because I feel like being a pulmonary critical care physician, you have that unique skill to help anyone and everyone in any way possible. And for me, that's what being a doctor is all about. It's all about helping people. And it's all about being better today when compared to yesterday. And I feel like pulmonary critical care provides that. So typically a day is gonna be after I go to the gym, I'll go to clinic in the morning, I'll go to the hospital in the afternoon, and about twice a week I'll stay in the hospital until midnight just to help out the ICU doc at night, and then just to make my next day more efficient, being able to go to a long-term acute care facility in the middle of the night just to check on patients, make sure everything's stable from that standpoint. So it really depends on the day, but I think it's a private practice attending. Your day can be altered uh, depending on where help is needed. But for the most part, it's usually clinic, hospital, um, some procedures uh, in the hospital, and uh, so on and so forth. But it's a pretty exciting day. When you do a lot of different things, it helps with uh, keeping you engaged throughout the day. You want oatmeal? No. You want oatmeal? No. You don't want oatmeal? No. What do you want? No, I need, I need this. Okay. Taste it. I can't. think that like going from hospital to hospital patient to patient is the hardest part of my day it's the funnest part of my day but actually the most difficult part of my day is this decision what shoe am I gonna wear today is it a Yeezy day is it a Jordan day we've got these which are just super fire and I'll wear these, I don't care. These shoes are made to be worn, so you wear them. Um, we've got the Unions here. Maybe uh, some old school Jordan 4s here. It's usually you start pulling shoes out and then things start to kind of come together and you're like, you know what, I really want to feature these today. We got a little bit of pink on. 
It might clash with that purple. But right now I'm thinking these. Blue tints? No, not the blue tints. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. Maybe go with the originals. Maluga 2.0s. No, I don't think so. Sorry. It's difficult, guys. Maybe the fly knit racers today. It's not going to rain. It's multicolored. Springtime. It's May 1st. Kind of a basic shoe. You kind of look at it and you're like, oh, those are in. Oh, oh, those are kind of fire. So, I mean, I think that's the kind of thing you want to go with. Probably go with those. I think the decision's made. You know what? I changed my mind. I'm not going to go with my fly nets. I think I'm going to go with my custom Hirachis. Thing is, is they're at the top. So I don't have to jump my ass up there to grab them. Are you ready? Oh. Hold on. Let me grab them with two hands. Yeah, I'm feeling these today. I'm feeling these. Lego. I have no idea. I don't even count. Not that many, though. I think there's people with a lot more. But look at this. Check this out. You guys think that I'm a sneakerhead. I want you to look. We're going to look over at my wife's side of the closet. She's got some of the shoes I got. She got her little pink Jordan 1s, the Crimson's here. You know Daddy had to buy her some 11s. All right. She's got on her Air Zoom Pegasus. But look at these customs I had done. She's afraid to wear them because she says that, well, it's Louis Vuitton and they're not really Louis Vuitton. But look at these custom bands I had made for her. Sick with it. Look at that ridiculous and then she has all this stuff and we got two pairs of shoes for her coming today so i kind of turned her into a little mini sneakerhead we're getting there then i gotta work on my six-year-old so we're gonna head to irvine clinic now uh pulmonary clinic in irvine we're gonna see who we need to see and what things we need to do for people to help them feel better about themselves So this is pulmonary clinic. This is where I see patients on a daily basis, where you have a line of patients who are waiting for you. You go see them, they, your, your nurses, your assistants put them in a room. You have objective data, x-rays, CAT scans, lab values. You go into the room, you see the patient, they tell you their symptoms. You determine what their data means to their symptoms, what you're gonna do about certain things, how you're gonna manage certain things, and you wanna make sure that you're making people better or you're not allowing them to get worse. In terms of why I selected pulmonary and critical care, other than the inspiration behind my grandfather and the pulmonary disease that he suffered from, which is emphysema, an entity of COPD, it was really out of just the variety of procedures and duties that you have as a pulmonary critical care physician. We do many different things. We run intensive care units, right, where people are fighting for their life. We put things in people. We put, we put things in their chest. We put things in their mouth. We do procedures where we biopsy the lung. We do procedures where we're washing the lung out. We can deal with patients that have immunological problems like asthma, like interstitial lung disease. We can deal with patients that have cancers. We have to understand the way the immune system works. We have to understand the way the cancer cell works. There are so many different varieties that this specialty provides that allows you to, in my opinion, not burn out. Right? You have different things that you can do. If you want to be outpatient, work 9 to 5, you can be outpatient. If you want to be inpatient, you can be inpatient. If you want to do both, like I do, you can really have a different kind of day. Your morning will be different than your evening. So it keeps you on your toes. It keeps you alert. It keeps you awake. It keeps you learning. And that's what's important. Hey, Ms. Jackson. I'm Dr. Rutland. I'm one of the pulmonary critical care physicians here. Uh, I have read a little bit about you. I looked at your cat. So look, there's a break in the day. We got a few moments. We're gonna get out our bag, even if it's only for 45 minutes, even if it's only for 60 minutes. We're gonna get our bag out, we're gonna open up our computer, we're gonna read some papers, and we're gonna learn something new. That's the key with doing this whole thing is you always wanna be learning something new when you're a physician. When you're a 
resident, attending, fellow, whatever you are, you always be learning something new. So you always need to have a backpack in your car and have books in your car because you never know when you're gonna need them to read. So get it done. Living in Southern California provides you with the opportunity to change your scenery. When you change your scenery and, you, and you're in a different environment, you also gain a new energy, right? A new energy for studying, a new passion for studying. One of the things that I'm looking at today is an article on what's called interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, disease that's caused by white blood cells and their products attacking lungs, attacking certain parts of the lung that leads to inflammation and the need for oxygen. You want to be able to combat that. So what I've had to learn along my training, and I'm talking medical school, residency, fellowship, medical school, four years, residency, three years, fellowship, three years, you learn how you learn and you learn how to make yourself better on a daily basis. You know what articles to go after. You know what books to read. You have to be able to do that. Iowa, University of Iowa, where I attended medical school, was able to teach me that. And they taught me that very, very well. And I owe probably everything that I know and everything that I do on a daily basis to Iowa. And not only that, is the medicine part is easy. Knowing where to go to get the information on diseases after a while, the training teaches you that. But what's hard is picking up how to run a practice, what hospitals you go to, what contracts you have to have, who is a good doctor in the area that you can refer to? All of those things you learn as well. And that's a major difference between academics and private practice. Private practice, you're sustaining yourself. You're billing yourself. You have to know what you get paid for doing this procedure, seeing this patient, seeing that patient, versus academics where you just kind of work for a university system and then they worry about the billing. They worry about the collecting. As I've said throughout the day, the theme is to learn something new every day. And that's how I attack life. That's how I attack my days, that's how I attack my weeks, my months, and that's definitely how I attack my career. So I think, you know, a lot of times when you are in training, when you are early on in your career, you know, we have a tendency to want to impress our superiors or our colleagues, right? So we spend all this time using this information that we've collected from patients, from imaging, from labs, and we present it to our superiors, right? And we try to have this great story and put it together and get them to think what we're thinking. But I think what gets lost is that everything that we're doing is actually for the person in the bed, it's for the patient, for their family members. So as you learn all these medical terms, it's your job to learn how to interpret these so you can explain it to the common person. And that's the important lesson here. And once I learned how to do that, that's when my medical practice got a little bit better I noticed is once I was able to interpret things and explain it to the patient and their family. I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm right here. One, two. <laughs> Daddy's a cookie to crack or hard. I can, I can crack or it, yeah. Crack. See, it's just morning, it lasts three times. Oh, she counts them. <laughs> you know, we've had a pretty a pretty long day. I mean, today I did a few procedures. One of them is called a pericardiocentesis, all right? And that's where, where your heart's pumping, you have fluid around the heart. And as you guys can imagine, when your heart's pumping, if there's fluid around it, it can put a, enough pressure on the heart so the heart can't get rid of the blood that it's receiving, right? And if you can't do that, people pass out, people's blood pressures are low. So what you saw was you saw me actually stick a needle to right outside of the heart to the pericardial space, and that's where I drew off that fluid. Now, most people who have that, right, who develop fluid like that, probably have a malignancy or a cancer of some kind. You've seen me stick needles in lungs from the backside going over the rib into what's called the pleural space. That's called a thoracentesis, where you take a needle and a little catheter. You go right over the posterior 
superior aspect of the rib, um, posterior is back. And you go right into that flow space, you draw that fluid off. You see me do bronchoscopy where I actually take a bronchoscope and I look inside someone's lung. And there I can biopsy the lung, I can biopsy lymph nodes, I can suction things if somebody has mucus in there. Remember the lung is a balloon, so if mucus gets caught in the lung or in the bronchial, right, which is the pipe that carries air to the lung, when mucus gets caught there, your lung essentially deflates, and so you have to go in there sometimes and suction that mucus out to allow the lung to re-expand, all right? And when the lung wants to re-expand, people cough, because when you cough, it actually closes your vocal cords, and it pushes air through the lung to allow it to re-inflate, right? So coughing after procedures like that is common. Um, so, you know, the day was... The day was a typical day for me. This is this is what I do, this is what I love, this is what I live for. People always ask about struggle and obstacle because some people might look at my life and say, oh, you're really smart, or oh, this was really easy. It was not easy and I was not at the top of any class ever. I never was, but I did try to be better today. In terms of struggle that I went through, I just finished college, I took a year off work for my parents. Um, I didn't get into medical school the first time around, or I withdrew my application. The second time around, I applied to medical school and got a letter back from University of Iowa, which is really where I wanted to go, and I was number 104 on the out-of-state wait list, right? And it was like June, and school started in like August. I told myself that, what does this letter say? It says I'm number 104. It didn't even say my name. It just said, you said you are number 104. I told myself, you know what? I'm gonna call these fools every day and let them know who I am because I don't want to be 104. I want to be Jamie. I want to be Cedric. I want to be future Dr. Rutland. I don't want to be 104. So what did I do? I called those motherfuckers every single day. I called them. I emailed. I got to know Linda in the financial aid office. I got to know Annette in the admissions office. And I started calling them by their first name. What happened next? I was number 69. I was number 53. I was number 37. I was number 21. I was number nine. I was number eight. I was number three. And then on August of 2005, I got a phone call and it was the financial aid person who I actually had gotten to know the best. And she said, hey, Jamie. She didn't say 104. She said, guess what? And I was like, I'm in. And she was like, you damn right. And so I think it's a lesson of trying to define yourself for who you are. Try to be yourself. Do not let anyone tell you that you're just a number because you're more than that. I think that what's important are advice that I give to other people, right? So I think there are three pieces of advice that I like to give. I always give, I always speak in threes. No more, no less. Three is the number of harmony. So the first piece of advice I would give is, I want you to be better today when compared to yesterday. Be better today when compared to yesterday. Do a little bit more. Because when you wake up the next day, it is another opportunity. Every time the sun rises, it's another opportunity for you to be better. Take advantage of that. Number two, diligence. Have diligence. Work really hard. Work really hard so you get to know yourself work really hard so you're forced to listen to yourself and become self-aware of not only what's around you but what's inside you work hard that will get you farther than you think the third thing be nice i'm not saying if somebody's being an asshole to you to be nice right but i am telling you to consider it you never know what kind of day that person had. And if you could put a smile on someone's face that had a shitty day that you don't know about, that's what's gonna get them through the day. I've had people say things to me and say, you know, you remember that one time when you just said X and I was just being nice. And I'm not saying that I do this perfectly because I'm not perfect and, I don't, and I'm not nice 100% of the time, but I know that I should be. And so that's why I spread that. I want you to be nice. I guarantee you, if you can do at least those three things, you'll have a successful and accomplished life. I'm here to help you. I'm here to give advice. I'm here to work alongside of you. And I want you to know that. So I hope you enjoyed the day, and I hope you enjoy the advice. Hey guys, it's 7.14 p.m. on a nice Wednesday night. 
I hope you enjoyed the day, a uh, typical day in my life, uh, which can be a little crazy. So I appreciate you joining. Uh, if you guys want to see more, you guys can follow me at, at Dr. J. Rutland on Instagram or at Dr. J. Rutland on Twitter. Uh, please leave comments or feedback from my man, Dr. Jubal, um, and let us know what we can do better to improve and let us know if, uh, if you like our advice or not. Uh, I hope you guys have a good day. All right, guys, so we're just leaving the hospital. This is what it's like being a pulmonary critical care physician. Hope you enjoyed the day as we went from procedure to procedure, as we gave out a little bit of medical advice. You know, it can be crazy, but it's exciting. Um, I'll see you guys next time. All right, guys, you guys have a good day. Are you okay with me working this hard? Um, I'm okay with you following your dreams. So if that's what it takes, sure. Obviously, we'd like to have you around more. <laughs> But you're okay with I it. I support it. I support you. Did yes. the when I said in the beginning, I like to study, I like to work hard, did that have any uh, influence on your thought? Um, I mean, I think the beauty about our relationship is that we communicate and we know what to expect. And that I knew what I was getting into. And that there's support is equal. It goes back and forth with both ways. All right, bye. Okay. Yeah. The answer is no. Come on, doc. I'm talking about, I'm minding my business, doing it for the gram, and he just disagreeing. It's, a, it's amazing because I'll be like, I'll be like, man, Doc J, you looking swole right now. Your gains are coming. His bottom lip. I hate compliments. You see how, you see how like, Vast backwards that is. That's a vast backwards statement. People, that is a vast backwards statement. I hate compliments. What a human hates to feel great about themselves. It's a good point. However, <laughs> I think. However, the compliment has a sense of achievement. Yeah. Like, like I've done something, and I feel like I haven't done shit. So I think that comes from a from a like innate desire to just be better than you are but you can't neglect already what you've accomplished or am i wrong no you're, you're probably right so we have to reward the small daily battles we have to reward those small victories and when i take the time to say outstanding well done congratulations i'm happy i don't waste those compliments for no reason Thank you.